the study of dynamics in a certain science field, refers to the study of the time history of an observed quantity, along with the influences that cause the change in value of the quantity with time. The word kinetics is used in some books and fields to mean dynamics. Thus, in general, the words kinetics and dynamics can be used interchangeably. In the last chapter, we studied kinematics of a point particle, in one dimension, and in two and three dimensions. We learned how the different kinematic variables, such as the instantaneous and average position, velocity, and acceleration, are related to each other. In kinematics, we studied motion of a particle without considering the causes of the motion. In motion dynamics, on the other hand, we will study both the motion and the causes of motion. Dynamics of a point particle can be defined as the field of study that allows us to predict the motion of a particle. If we have information about the physical influences, called forces, that affect the motion of the particle. Also, conversely, inverse dynamics is the field of study that allows us to determine the forces that are acting on a particle, if we know the motion of the particle. The particle can be an object of interest to us, such as a rocket, an airplane, a car, a boat, a person, a ball. and so on. The fundamental dynamics physical laws that govern the relation between the motion, and causes of motion of many common everyday life objects, were formally defined by Sir Isaac Newton in his 1687 book called, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Therefore, the study of dynamics of those objects is also called Newtonian mechanics, in honor of Newton. Newtonian mechanics is also called classical mechanics, to differentiate it from more modern era theoretical physics theories, such as the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, which are collectively referred to as modern physics. Since Newtonian mechanics laws were derived more than three centuries ago, the tools that were available to make the observations necessary to derive those laws were the human senses. Sticks and tapes for length measurement, rudimentary telescopes, and clocks that are accurate to just a fraction of a second. Electricity had not been discovered yet. This limited the experimental basis for Newtonian mechanics laws, to physical objects that can be directly observed by the available tools of the time. Therefore, Newtonian mechanics describes the dynamic behavior of objects that have the following two characteristics. The scale of the objects that can be studied by classical mechanics, range from a fraction of the width of a human hair, to star-sized objects. Objects that can be studied by Newtonian mechanics, must be moving at speeds that are well below the speed of light. This range of applications is actually very large, and covers the majority of common everyday life applications, such as motion of rockets and airplanes. Motion of cars and trucks. Motion of industrial machines. Motion of humans and animals. Motion of water in oceans and rivers. Motion of wind. And so on. Objects that cannot be modeled by Newtonian mechanics include. Objects that are very small such as molecules, atoms and electrons. Objects that are very massive, such as large stars and black holes and objects that are moving at, or near, the speed of light. Newtonian mechanics consists of the following four laws. Newton's first, second and third laws of motion. And Newton's law of gravitation. We will study those laws in this chapter.
Recall that a frame is a coordinate system relative to which, we can measure the motion of an object. The kinematic relations that we derived in the last chapter are valid in any reference frame. However, the dynamics laws that we will study in this chapter, need the concept of a special reference frame that is called an inertial reference frame. An inertial frame is formally defined as a frame that satisfies the following two conditions. It is a frame relative to which, physical laws can be expressed in their simplest form. And second, it is a frame relative to which, physical laws can be expressed in the same form. In every inertial frame. Practically, an inertial reference frame can be defined as a frame that is moving at a constant velocity, and is not rotating relative to the average universe. Scientists since Newton's time defined the average universe as the fixed stars in the sky. We now know that nothing in the universe is fixed. However, if we average out the motion of everything in the universe, then, a frame that follows this average motion, and any frame that is moving at a constant velocity and that is not rotating with respect to that frame, is an inertial reference frame. By this definition, nothing fixed to Earth can be in an inertial reference frame. However, for Earth-bound applications, we can define an approximate inertial reference frame as a frame that is moving at a constant velocity, and not rotating with respect to Earth. This is a good approximation because the effects of motion of the Earth on Newton's laws are small for human-sized and smaller objects. Note that once we define the laws of physics relative to an inertial reference frame, then we can easily extend them to non-inertial reference frames. Newton's first law of motion, can be stated as A body acted upon by no external influence, will continue moving at a constant velocity, in other words zero acceleration, relative to an inertial reference frame. We have already seen three experiments that prove this law in the kinematics chapter. In the first experiment, we placed a puck on a 1D horizontal path. Then we eliminated all external influences that can affect the motion of the puck, such as friction, air resistance, gravity effects, electrical effects and magnetic effects. Then, we gave the puck an initial velocity, and we observed that the puck moves at a constant velocity that is equal to that initial velocity. In other words, the acceleration of the puck is equal to zero. To review this experiment, you can click on the highlighted link. In the second experiment, we placed a puck on a 2D air hockey table. And again we eliminated all external influences that can affect the motion of the puck. We gave the puck an initial velocity in a certain direction. And observed that the puck moves at a constant velocity that is equal to the initial velocity. In a straight line that is along the direction of the initial velocity direction. To review this experiment, you can click on the highlighted link. In the third experiment, we gave a ball in a space station, an initial velocity. By simply pushing it. Again we eliminated all external influences that can affect the motion of the ball. Gravity was eliminated by performing the experiment in a microgravity environment on a space station. We observed that the ball moves at a constant velocity that is equal to the initial velocity, in a straight line that is in the direction of the initial velocity direction. To review this experiment, you can click on the highlighted link. All these experiments prove Newton's first law, namely that if a body has an initial velocity, it will continue moving at that initial velocity, in a straight line, as long as there are no external influences acting on the body. Now let's write the equation of motion for a point particle that obeys Newton's first law. The equation of motion is the particle velocity vector, v, is equal to a constant. In three dimensions we can write this as, v1, v2, v3, is equal to v01, v02, v03, where v01 is the velocity component in the x direction. V02 is the velocity component in the y direction. 
and V03 is the velocity component in the Z direction. The position vector of the particle is given by X of T is equal to X of T0 plus the integral from T0 to T of V of T dt. In component form, this can be written as shown. Then solving the integral, we get x1 is equal to x01 plus t minus t0 times v01. And similarly x2 is equal to x02 plus t minus t0 times v02. And x3 is equal to x03 plus t minus t0 times v03. Note that this is the equation of a straight line in three dimensions. That has a direction that is parallel to vector v0. This implies that a particle moving at a constant velocity, will move along a straight line that is in the same direction as the constant velocity vector. The acceleration vector is the first derivative of the velocity vector. In component form this can be written as shown. Since the velocity components are constant, therefore the derivative of each component with respect to time is zero. And therefore the acceleration vector is equal to the zero vector. So Newton's first law can be written in short as the acceleration vector of a particle that is under no external influence is equal to zero. This automatically implies that the velocity is constant and that the particle is moving along a straight line path. Note that in two dimensions, it's written as a1, a2 is equal to zero. And in one dimension, a1 is equal to zero. From Newton's first law, we know that an object that is under no external influence, moves with zero acceleration, i.e., constant velocity. It follows that if the object is subjected to an external influence, then this influence will cause the acceleration to no longer be zero. The external influence can be a push or a pull on the object in a certain direction. Let's give this external influence a name. Let's call it force. So force is a push or pull on an object in a certain direction. That changes the acceleration of the object. And since acceleration is a vector quantity, i.e., in three-dimensional space it has three independent components in three directions, we expect force also to be a vector quantity. This means that force has three independent components. We will find out in the rest of this chapter that for a force acting on a point particle, each force components affects the corresponding component of acceleration of the particle. Force component 1 affects acceleration component 1. Force component 2 affects acceleration component 2. And force component 3 affects acceleration component 3. Next we will conduct some experiments to derive a mathematical expression for force. Let's design an experiment to find a relation between force and acceleration. Let's place a puck.